And she's over here. We. And uh, today, we're, this morning, we're going to look at the avoider imprint. And um, the avoider imprint is pretty common. And it, it you know, it, it seems normal. You can't hear me? Oh, I didn't. Oh, my mask. <laughs> okay. How, how's that? Is that better? <laughs> I worked at the VA for a year doing chaplain training, and if you're in a hospital, they're very strict on masking, and so I got used to wearing a mask all day long unless I was in a, my own office by myself. Uh, it was a chaplain training program, and so you, I just got used to it after a while. Yeah, it's hot and humid and whatever, but you just forget about it. But thank you for the reminder. <clears throat> I'm sure my voice is probably clear this way, too. Yeah. And uh, feel free to remind me next session uh, as well. So, in Scripture, one of the promises of God is that God heals the brokenhearted and does what? Some translations say binds up or bandages their wounds. And so we're claiming that promise for our lives uh, Many times in Christianity, we, we hear the big dramatic stories and the transformation that happened, you know, overnight. And uh, we used to celebrate those people, and they would go church to church and speak and share their story. And, and God does those things. But most of the time, the healing is a slow, steady process. In our own faith group, we have someone that we believed was given inspiration by God that said sanctification is the work of a lifetime. You know, when Jesus discipled the 12 disciples, he didn't just stand in front of a pulpit and talk to them and teach them intellectual material. He had them go with him places and see how they responded to situations and guide them and counsel them because it's in the day-to-day -day of life that things really pop up and reveal. In fact, in chaplain training, that you would think they'd give you all kinds of preparation before you go out and visit patients. They just throw you there, out there, and then you reflect on it. And basically, they say the way that you function in life is going to be revealed in the way you respond to people and to your peers, and, and that's where your growth is going to come, in reflecting on your experiences. And, and so Jesus very much uh, did that. And as we see for the disciples, it took time for them to grow, and they had some intense uh, growth experiences. So we can claim that promise, even though it's not fully realized in us until the resurrection, we can know that God is in the process of doing that for us. And isn't that good news? We seem to be stuck, and I don't know if I'm not doing something right here. Oh. We'll probably come back to that. Okay. Remind me to come back to this slide. We're going to skip Dusty because I kind of shared my story, my experience. So we saw that Adam and Eve in their broken state were promised hope by God. And, you know, if you have hope for the future, you have everything. You know, circumstances can be really bad around you. And I think about the world we live in today, no matter which 
side of the political aisle or no political aisle you're coming from, we live in uh, a decaying world. Uh, just the natural disasters alone increasing in intensity and, and, and prevalence and, and frequency is, is really going to cause us problems, I believe, and it's a reminder of what Jesus warned us of. But we're, we're here. We have the gift of His Son, Jesus Christ. We have the promise of the Holy Spirit. And I may not say this enough, but these are things that we have to take to the Lord and pray over regularly on a daily basis to ask Him to create in us a clean heart and grant in us the right spirit. And then, of course, we have to do our part to practice what we do know. And uh, we, we could talk, we'll talk about do-overs. But we're still looking for that time, for the resurrection, for all things to be made new. And we're in the process of growth and transformation and learning to continue to practice trusting God and, um, in the day-to-day -day affairs of life. And, but we said we also want to try to go upstream and maybe save some marriages, save some families. Save some single people. Uh, you know, save some churches. Save, you know, uh, if we can, can uh, know we can be empowered and we can know how to grow and change. And I believe God has given people the gift of discernment and the gift of wisdom to be able to help God speak. And... Um, so tools, and we're looking at the tool of comfort and how in an ideal home environment we're raised with lots of comfort. And I was talking with someone and the person said, you know, my parents were always around. So it's not like they weren't there, um, but they weren't emotionally available. And so you can have parents that are physically available, but they're emotionally preoccupied with other things doesn't mean they're bad people, but, you know, there, there is a reality there that um, that, um, that could have had an effect. It's, it's uh, like that thorn in the flesh that maybe Paul had or, or uh, the handicap that Jacob had that you have to learn to grow and work with and, and uh, become a better version of you. Matthew 22, Jesus said, and read this with me, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, saying all the law and the relation to prophets. I'm thinking as I'm reading it and then telling you what I'm thinking. <laughs> this is a relational verse. Loving God with how much of yourself? All of yourself. Loving your neighbor uh, as you love yourself. And um, so God assumes there that Jesus, that there is a place to love yourself. And, uh, and out of that, to be able to love others. You know, the challenge with this is we grow up in, we're living in an imperfect world. We grew up in an imperfect world and we get affected by that, and we develop patterns of coping. And many times those patterns of coping served us well. They helped us to make it through life. But their usefulness becomes uh, less apparent, or they become less useful as we become adults, and the things that helped us cope now can become problematic or detrimental or uh, create interference into what we need to become as adults. And so we're going to talk about the avoider love style uh, today. We said that all children are born as a bundle of needs and um, have feelings and, and need someone to care for them and provide for them. And that's how God created it. That was his plan. I don't understand all the things of God, but as we study humans, we can learn about how God designed us 
and designed what our needs and to provide and look out and care for each other and by doing that, shaping us to become in the image of Him. And so, uh, child had needs. Let me pause and just say Jesus had needs. When He was about to go to the cross, what did He do? Did He go all by Himself to pray? To a certain extent, He did. But He also called three people with him. And he shared with them, I am really burdened. Won't you come and pray with me? Now his friends weren't perfect, but they were there for him the best they could, and then God made up the difference. Uh, and, um, <clears throat> and so Jesus, you know, if you reflect on his life, he shared his needs. He was able to share. He was able to set boundaries. He was able to give. He was able to receive. You know, if some woman came and broke a bottle of ointment and started rubbing on my feet, I'd freak out. But Jesus was able to receive that gift. He knew her. He knew what her intention was. And, huh? He had forgiven her. He had blessed her life. And he was able to accept her intimate gift to him. For me, that would have been really uncomfortable. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there, we could reflect on, on some of those things along the way. But um, he was able to see the good and bad in, in his disciples. Peter, heaven's revealed this to you. He makes Peter one of his inner core. But he's also going to say, Peter, Satan gave you that message. Uh, but he wasn't all good or all bad. You know, he understood that we're, we're all a mixture. And so... Uh, in the avoidant home, child has needs, and those needs are overwhelming to the parent. Or the parent shows disinterest. Now, we're not talking in extremes here, you know, that the parent shows no interest. But there's a lesser level of sensitivity and in tuneness and availability to a child's needs. And so as a result, the child's expression over time, it's not one chant here and one event there and another event somewhere else, although we did say trauma in life can sometimes disrupt this and cause some of these things, even in the best of, of growing up environments. Uh, so a child's expression becomes stifled or limited by the parent's response. Why do you think the child's expression might become stifled or limited? Yeah. Okay, could be suppressed by the parent. You're going to cry? You want to cry? I'll give you what? Cry about. Now, you know, I've probably said that myself, you know, uh, or felt that at times, uh, you know, here or there, once in a while, but when those things become a pattern, then they become challenging. They become problematic. So a child learns, yes, yes. Yes, I remember a pastor friend of mine sharing, he'd written a lot on the Holy Spirit, and he was sharing at a presentation um, that he was adopted, and his paperwork said that he he didn't he doesn't cry. You know, he was taken out of a home or or whatever because of neglect, and that he didn't cry, and he realized I stopped crying because nobody responded. And so that can happen to varying degrees. You know, those are extreme degrees. But, you know, sometimes we experience it, you know, not so extreme, and it can have a, an effect on us. And so in this environment, the child's expression becomes stifled or limited. Uh, the parental response is they encourage limited expression of emotions 
or discourage the expression of emotions and does not provide a lot of comfort. There's probably very, very few places that provide no comfort. But we're talking about where less than needed comfort was provided, which for some of us just seems to be normal. I grew up in a single, you know, without a father. That seemed normal to me. Um, But I realized in doing some reading and research that it had an effect on me. Uh, Reaction. So the child uh, restricts emotions and needs and becomes independent. So the child learns, I've got to take care of myself. And I can't rely on a lot of people to take care of my needs. And so they develop an avoider imprint that avoids emotions and needs of self and who? Others. Now again, you can have extreme uh, where people just don't like other people and want to just have pets and live alone and don't want to be around anybody. Most of us aren't there, but we might be you know, somewhere more towards moderate to to mild. I like this cartoon. I got in touch with my feelings once. They said, leave them alone and mind my own business. (laughs) Don't go there. Uh, Avoiders don't like these seminars. Vacillators like them until they find out, oh, you mean I got issues too? You know, or, or my issues are bigger than I thought. Uh, voiders don't uh, like this. When I was first talking to my wife about she, she's more of a mathematical science mind, and she thought it was just a bunch of theory and so forth. And then as she began to see it, it did uh, apply to her. It applies to a lot of people uh, in, again, varying degrees. So I want to have you just break quickly and share a time when you were not comforted as a child but needed it. So try to think of a moment. You're not all going to have time to share, but turn to two or three people, uh, one or two people, and um, if there's like three of you, two, four, whatever, and try to think of a time And maybe one person can share where they needed comfort, but it wasn't available. Go. I've probably barely given you enough time to try to think of an example. <laughs> but unfortunately, we, we live in time and space and are limited in time. Uh, the memory that came to me was when I was maybe fifth grade, I had this girlfriend, whatever that meant in fifth grade. Um, maybe we talked on the phone once in a while or liked each other or whatever. And she broke up with me or whatever. And then that happened a few years later. I would never and never did, even as an adult, feel inclined to share that with my mother. You know, uh, some some families, you know, the sharing goes on, and parents ask about your day and how was school, and 
maybe help them problem solve if they're facing a social situation and, you know, give them a little coaching and some encouragement. Not a lot of advice giving, but, you know, just being available. I didn't know what that was. My mother didn't have it. And, yeah, my mother was a good person, just just wasn't a part of uh, life experiences. I'm sure she probably would have provided if I initiated it, but maybe not. I don't know. So the avoider imprint and injury, the parent model, minimal comfort, comfort and nurturing, uh, minimal physical affection or concern for the child's emotions. Uh, parents are emotionally absent, so they may be physically present, but they're, they're not in tune. Uh, the parents value tasks, independence, and performance. Now you could have two or three children grow up in the same home and they can react differently based on their personality. Um, <clears throat> but this is the common imprint for the avoider, a common environment. Uh, expectations of the avoider then become take care of myself and need little from others. Not that they don't want have any relationships. They you know, like people, want to be married probably, unless you're a really extreme avoider. Um, uh, but you don't need a lot from people. And uh, their passion becomes to experience affirmation. In order to do that, I must excel at something. And this is probably not necessarily even a conscious thing, but something that just becomes a part of their modus operandi. To get the affirmation and care and uh, love or support from my parents, I've got to do well at school or sports or church or whatever it is. And so um, that's where they find their rewards. That's where they find uh, their needs met as tasks and projects, primarily. Uh, so their goals are to be independent, self-sufficient, and do things well. Uh, they learn, do not be needy so you will not be hurt or disappointed. And so feelings actually start to get cut off where you just don't have a wide range of feelings. You don't even have a wide range of, of memories, maybe, of growing up and, and, and so forth. Um, and so the Bible says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart. Well, for an avoider, that's going to be doing tasks and projects for God primarily. Not as much in, not that they don't read the Bible or whatever, but their greatest passion is going to be doing things for God, not abiding in God, uh, unless, you know, they grow in that area. Uh, triggers for them, criticism from others, others' emotional situations or needs. Uh, they're going to stay away from needy people, except for when they get married, they might be drawn to a needy person. Uh, feelings, underdeveloped. Uh, very steady, likable people. Um, Good-natured, good-hearted people. Don't want a lot of drama, don't want fighting and stuff like that, and aren't likely to react unless you back them in a corner or push them too hard in some area <clears throat> of connection or whatever. There is some underlying anxiety, uh, underlying anger, and feelings of inadequacy. So their coping response is to tend toward detaching from people. And again, it doesn't have to be complete isolation, um, but they don't need people as much as other people might need people. Uh, can be withdrawn or have poor eye contact, but not necessarily. Uh, again, they learn to detach from feelings and needs and excel in tasks and projects and excellent. You might be a voider if you tend to be private and self-sufficient. And avoiders can be extroverts or they can be introverts. You could be gregarious and talkative and outgoing, but people don't know much about you. And if they bring some emotional needs, they might be, I, I don't do that. I, you know, I, let's, let's just kind of keep it on the surface level. Um, or you could be private and, or, you know, more introvert, introvert and quiet. And that goes for all of these. Um, when you ask them how they're doing, usually they're fine because they do feel fine. They don't need much emotional connection or affection and they experience few emotions. 
Uh, if you're a voter, you might be inclined not to ask for emotional investment or commitment from people, unless it's for tasks and projects. <clears throat> uh, you might comply to avoid arguments in your relationships, whether it's marriage or others. You might minimize and resist expressions of anger in others and self, yet do get angry when people try to get too close and want too much from you emotionally. You're happiest when others are happy and don't want a lot from you. Uh, High-achieving person. You enjoy people but can become drained by them. Uh, prefer to do something for someone or give gifts rather than connect emotionally. Uh, felt resentment. You might be avoided if you felt resentment towards your spouse for wanting more from you emotionally. And you get tired of hearing how distant you are. Now often this is a man in the relationship. <clears throat> but it can also be female. So men are often hearing, you know, you're never here for us, you know, for the kids or this or that, and men get tired of the nagging. Well, there might be something there. Uh, you don't really think about your own feelings and needs very much. You, you're not in tune with them. I remember my wife would occasionally say, man, I'm stiff or I feel anxious. And I'd say, well, why? I don't know. And so I'd probe and say, what's going on here? And ask about this and ask about that. And after a few minutes, we'd probably figure out what's bothering her. Something's bothering her, but she had no idea what it was. Can anyone identify with that? Or maybe you know someone like that. Um, that may be, you may be an avoider. I mean, yeah, I mean, we all can have times where we don't know what's bothering us, but more common for an avoider. Um <clears throat> Uh, what to do? Own your injury and, after, and, and the ways that you've learned to cope. So we said earlier, you've got to own this. You've got to know. I think I, for some reason I don't have the parenting part. And let me pause and mention that. Um, <clears throat> in parenting, avoiders like their kids to be beyond la their age level in their competency. Uh, they want... Not that they want them necessarily physically to grow up, but they're real excited if their child can potty train earlier than maybe what's expected developmentally or, or uh, you know, other aspects of their life. And so they, they kind of have, I would say, high expectations. And um, they love their kids, but uh, not necessarily uh, as... Um, in tune with what their kids may need. And again, this is mild, moderate, and severe. Um, so what to do? Own your injury. Like Jacob, admit it, I am an avoider. And, uh, and become own the ways that you've learned of coping. Develop compassion for yourself and your journey. Uh, I'll share this for my wife. Uh, she's given me permission. Um, she became interested in this material when she became a women's ministries leader. And she felt it would be good for the women to have this material. And so she asked me if I would present something to the women, or I forget what it was. And um, I think it was maybe doing a weekend or session. I don't remember what it was. I might get some of the details mixed up. And she had a vision of how she wanted to do it, um, how she wanted it done. And she wanted to see people break up into groups and, and do things like that. And she knew that I was still growing and learning and trying to get the basics down. And so she decided she was going to help me with it. And quite frankly, these presentations would not exist if it weren't for her. Because she was able to help me get them on slides. Um, and so... Uh, it's, it's to her credit that I'm even able to, to, to do this. <clears throat> so she's decided, you know, I've got to become more acquainted with this material to help these people, these women that need it. And as she's reading it and processing it and trying to help me prepare for it, she starts weeping because she realized that the home that she grew up in was missing that emotional connection, 
that emotional presence. Maybe intellectually she might have been aware of that, but it hit her emotionally as she delved into it and started thinking about it and, and wanting to, to help other people with it. It struck her, wow, I am an avoider. She hates that term. Uh, she said one time, she said, what if you just called it type A? I said, okay, what, type A for avoider? Is that, you know? <laughs> uh, and here's the thing. These, this information can be weaponized. You know, I can weaponize this against my wife or my kids, or they can weaponize it against me, or I could weaponize it against church members or whatever. That's not what this information is about. It's not about trying to fix and correct other people. It's about becoming the best version of ourselves for the honor and glory of God and for the betterment of our family and humanity. Amen? Because what happens when we become injured, it prevents us of, of God working in certain ways in our lives. But as we grow and become aware of it, God can, can work out more of his gifts in us to be of benefit to others and also to, to live a more abundant life. So um, uh, develop compassion for yourself and your journey. If you beat yourself up, you're, just, you're, you're not going to make progress. Increase awareness of your attachment style and injury. How is this affecting me in my work, in my family life, and my kids, or, or my friendships, or, or, or with God? I remember uh, telling her years ago, uh, she had some miscarriages that were devastating, that really, I think, became something that shook up her life. And, and that's often how it will happen in a voider. There'll be some trauma, trauma whether it's a divorce or or death, or something where it will just rock them out of their world and shake them out of their, you know, they can't, things they can't avoid. I remember talking about journaling and stuff, and journaling was just something with God she just could not imagine doing. And, and uh, but in her growth process, I'm not going to say that's first nature, but, you know, she has done some of that. And, and has been able to incorporate that in her life. Um, and so increasing the awareness and, and so forth. Uh, list disappointments experiencing growing up and share them with someone. Ask God to refresh your memories. Uh, reflect on the emotional availability of your parents in your life. Were they in tune with your feelings and hurts and so forth? Take responsibility for your traits and tendencies. You know, as I said earlier, I have my issues, but my issues are not my wife's issues. Uh, she has her issues, uh, but my issues are not her issues, if that makes sense. Now, I can make my issues her issues, but, you know, but basically we can only take ownership for ourselves and responsibility for ourselves. And there's this thing in systems theory that if, if you're in a system, a human system, and you make a change that change is going to affect the system in some way or another. Now, people can fight and resist that change, which is usually the first stage in systems theory that there's resistance, um, and they could even bail. But more than likely, they're going to adjust to that change. That change is going to influence the system for the good. Um, uh, read the chapters in How We Love on, on the Avoider do the exercises in the workbook and go through uh, a How We Love group, which we'll talk about later. Uh, practice the comfort circle. We're going to talk about that and see it demonstrated. Um, for voiders, they need to begin to recognize what they're feeling and expand their range of emotions. Uh, we have a, a thing that will be given out in the afternoon called the feelings word list. Some people, as we said, don't know what they feel. And so they need a list to look at to, to, to figure out what they feel. And so that could be a useful tool, tool in your growth and development. Uh, posting it and, and having it in front of you and uh, beginning to develop that. I remember hearing the presenters talk about looking through old pictures to go down memory lane to, to bring back memories of life and experiences. Begin journaling about childhood memories uh, 
on feelings, uh, uh, look at family pictures. Uh, become aware of how your body tenses when you encounter emotions. So you may not feel the emotion, but you might get tense. That tenseness is an indicator that something's going on. And uh, might be a tight chest, cl chest, clenched jaw, so on and so forth. You can, you can read those. Those may be signs of uh, suppressed feelings. Uh, smiling with telling a painful story is often a sign of blocking pain. Tell a painful, painful story without smiling and pay attention to any tightening of the body. Uh, practice making eye contact with your spouse. Lock gaze for one to two minutes. How comfortable was that for you, dear? Not very comfortable. For, for anybody, that's kind of awkward to just stare at someone. But for the avoider especially. Um, notice sensations in your body. What do you experience? Uh, move toward others when they're upset rather than becoming angry or withdrawn. So start practicing behaviors that may feel unnatural for you. You know, take, move beyond your comfort zone. Expect some anxiety. Admit to a person that you're feeling anxious and you do not know what to do, but will try to help. Um, ask someone for help, even if you don't feel you need it. Practice asking. I need talk, a hug, to take a walk with you. I need some time alone. For some of us, you might know you're stressed if you're on your phone a lot, or a computer, or some might clean, or, you know, uh, uh, you know, there are ways that we find of coping with stress that aren't necessarily helpful for us. Um, <clears throat> helping avoiders, it's important to affirm what may appear as their feeble efforts to reach out. If you're married to an avoider, and you're really frustrated and waiting, and they make a little effort. It may seem like nothing to you, but may have been a lot for them. And that's the same for any of these, the vacillator or whatever. What seems like a little effort may have taken a person a lot of effort. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all of your soul and with all your strength and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. We have to grow in that capacity and ability to love. Uh, avoiders tend to be more toward agnosticism, according to the book um, uh, God Attachment. Why do you think they might be more inclined to agnostics? We said that vacillators uh, were tended to be more towards atheism because of disappointment with God. Why do you think an avoider might tend to be indifferent to God? What's that? Self-sufficiency. Avoidance have learned not to need. Why would I need God? I'm, I'm okay. I've got life under control. I excel at my work. I've got a good home. You know, I'm proficient. I do things well. I don't need God would be the underlying aspect of it. Um, let me put you in a little secret. I think we have a lot of closet agnostics in our church. Agnostic Christians in our church. Let me tell you why. If you're an avoider and you're a Christian, you probably don't have a lot of need for God. You believe in God, you want to serve God. You believe in His Word. But you've got life together. You have not been trained to ask God to develop a close relationship with God. And so your service to God becomes primarily about tasks, goals, projects. And I'm not saying that to knock anybody because we all have our brokenness. But to the outside, you may look like this amazing evangelist or amazing church leader or whatever. But the reality is, is because of your woundedness, you have a challenge developing intimacy with God. And God wants more of your heart. You with me? 
And so God calls us to growth. He calls us to closeness. Behold, I stand at the door and everyone knock. Well, those knockings can take, or you know, you know the verse I'm referring to. Those knockings can take place in subtle ways. It's not just the big acceptance of God in our lives. Um, <clears throat> we may perceive God as un, uh, unreliable, higher levels of shame, uh, perceive God as punitive, judging versus loving and benevolent. Um, uh, to be spiritually immature, to struggle with life purpose. When I say immature, I'm not talking about immature on everyday events because they're good at, at that. But again, that God connection. Uh, recognize need for others to develop trust. Uh, but God means for us to be in relationship. So recall and remember personal experiences of God's comfort and care, however small, even if it may be through a pet, over and over. We want to build that and reinforce that. Staying aware of, aware of how I'm, I'm apt to respond under stress. Stress reveals things about us. Awareness allows me to check my response and lean in to God or into relationships and not out. Making time in my schedule to connect in my relationships. Being intentional about it. Um, how much time have we got? All right, this is a good time to take a break then. Um, I want to bring some life to this, and we'll do it in the afternoon, by showing you the comfort circle and seeing how it manifests in, in, in video form. But let me just take a couple minutes and see if you have any questions about the secure, the vacillator, the avoider. This afternoon, we're going to look at the pleaser, the one that tries to make everyone happy, and what caused that, how that affects their relationships, how it affects the relationship with God. We're going to look at the, the, the chaotic home, which uh, causes people to become controllers or victims. And then we're going to try to pull it all together and look at the comfort circle. Any quick questions? We'll have time in the afternoon. I expect if, if, yeah. Mm-hmm. John Wayne, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With a gun, with alcohol, or with your hands? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. We were conditioned that way. And, you know, quite frankly, there, are, there have been times and periods where people just had to survive. You know, they, they, my mother grew up in the Depression era as a child. Her mother had to grow a lot of food. Uh, and, 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 you know, they didn't have a lot of time uh, to share. Of course, the healthier families probably did come around the fire and share and talk and... and you know, so forth, but uh, certainly a lot of uh, survival and, uh, yeah, self-reliance. Uh, Pastor Sittler, um, I think we've come to the end of our time. Let me, I want to have a prayer over avoiders before we leave. Is now a good time? Father, I just tossed out a bunch of information, and um, uh, it may make sense, it may not, and I just Trust your Holy Spirit to, uh, to use this humble offering, uh, this primitive offering, for, uh, for the sake of your kingdom and, and your children. And pray that the seed will fall where it needs to fall and it will grow and multiply many times over. I thank you for what I've seen in the men's group that I worked with, with Blueprint for Men and the growth that took place there. And, and the singles ministry, and, and, and some of the families. And I'm sure there are many that just couldn't quite get there or figure it out or are still trying to work it out and, like I am, and, but uh, have uh, <clears throat> become more aware and have worked through growth. And 
Uh, we pray that uh, you will uh, just uh, come in and, and teach us what we need to know and in the way that we can learn it. We thank you in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Well, if the Holy Spirit hasn't um, touched you yet about what your uh, uh, love style is, it's coming. Mine's an avoider, so um, we've just, I can, as Pastor Brian is going through and sharing some of the things on the slides, I'm going, yes, that's the things I struggle with and uh, have to make sure I'm not constantly doing. We are going to break for lunch. Um, our goal is to come back by 2 o'clock. I know that's a, kind of a push, um, but we have people watching online. So if you are watching online, we'll be back at 2 o'clock. So um, where are we doing it? Are we doing it over in the uh, fellowship hall? Where are we doing food? Fellowship hall. So across the street, you can take and drive over there, park. You can walk. Just... Um, don't walk along the edge of Stanford Gap Road because, it's, as you know, if you know anything about this road, it's not the, it's not the, um, it's a little dangerous. So walk up the little road down around. But you can take your car. There's there's uh, parking over there in front of the school. Uh, just go to the right of the front door where the school is at, and while those doors open, that's where our fellowship hall is. So food is being prepared. Uh, that's where we're going to go, and then we'll come back here at two o'clock to continue our last two sessions. Pastor Brian, are you going to have time to share or at least refer to the in the book, How We Love, by the Ukraviches, there is, they describe how the different avoider, vacillator get together and what happens when those, if you think it's challenging when it's just, just you, start mixing together with other people. Then it really gets uh, interesting. So, uh, he, I see Janice Factor shaking her head. It I does. I was an amazing person before I got married and had kids. <laughs> I was perfect. Yeah, I was too. Uh, I was before I read this book too. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> but um, so we want to get you going. We don't. But uh, he's going to. Sh he'll share a little bit about that then too. And that's that's really helpful when you start realizing how you react in certain ways with other people and how you're drawn to them, sometimes in a positive way and sometimes not in a very positive way. So um, let's have prayer for our food uh, as we break. Father, we thank you for what you're sharing with us, not, not just information to take in or to write down and make notes and another book for our bookshelves. Lord, we want transformation of the heart and mind. And the way we think, the way we perceive life is how we live. And Lord, I've, saw that, I've seen that principle over and over in my life. And Holy Spirit, you want to bring to our understanding what's going on in us, the brokenness. Because then you can bring healing. And that healing, as Pastor Brian has mentioned, is like a pebble, a rock in a pond, and the ripple effect goes out. So it's a lot of things we're digesting in a quick period of time. But Holy Spirit, you've promised you'll continue to take it and use it. Bless our food as well in lunchtime and uh, strengthen us to come back to continue to learn and grow of who we really are and what we can be then in Jesus. In your precious name we pray. Amen. All right. Across the street where we'll be going to eat.